Good morning. Okay, I'm really nervous now. <laughs> I expect I like 20 people. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, forgive me, my voice is really bad. It, it apparently happens every time I have to give a talk. <coughs> I'll try not to cough, but it's, mm, I can relatively control it. You know where we are. Um, let's just, since you're so many, let's just do a show of hands. Uh, how many designers? How many developers? How many marketers? Okay, good, good. Um, hello. Um, this is what I do, which looks like a lot of stuff, but I've been doing it for a long time, so uh, it, I actually uh, do all of it. And you're going to understand this better at the end of this workshop. These are the three um, logos that characterize the three different um, areas that I communicate with. Um, let's give a hand right now so we get them ready for my TAs. Uh, Bohana? So today, we're going to do uh, a whole bunch of things. The first thing that I'm going to um, convey to you is something that it's a huge peeve of mine. Um, a brand is something and is not something else. And th there's a big misconception, so that's the first thing that I want to go through with you. Um, we're going to briefly see how the concept of branding has evolved uh, to get to what it means today. Uh, I will then give you my recipe um, to create and build a brand. I would also sh share with you some tips and tools. And then we're going to take a break. <coughs> and then we are going to put this into practice. And to do this, uh, the, the lovely assistants that you've just met are going to re um, represent six different clients. You're going to get grouped. Uh, so you're going to be agencies for an hour and a half. Uh, you're going to have clients that will explain to you. And you're going to come up with a branding strategy for them. There's going to be three personal brands and three business brands. That clear? You like? Should we go? Okay, so that's point one. Um, that's usually what I get after that slide. Like, huh? And what I mean with that is that a brand is not a logo. A logo is not a brand. The, they're not synonyms. And you shouldn't use the synonyms. A brand designer is not a logo designer. And a logo designer is not a brand designer. And I'm going to explain what I mean with that. What is this? Nike, right? Um, this is Nike. This is Nike's mission from their logo, from their website, I'm sorry. Um, OK. This is Nike's logo. This is Nike. This is Nike's logo. This is Nike. OK? The logo is a symbol. It's something that when I see, I think, I recognize Nike. But the brand is all the feelings I get when I think of Nike. Good, bad, it's irrelevant. It's the emotion. It's the non-tangible part of it. Another example. For those of you who know what this is, don't say it. Who knows what this is? Raise your hands. OK. What is this? Everyone knows this, right? So this is the All Blacks logo, but this is the All Blacks brand, OK? So when I see this, I see an icon for this. Okay, and that is what the logo is. The logo is an icon. It's a representation, a two-dimensional representation of a set of intangible values. 
which are called brand equity. So the brand is that set of valuables. So when you're brand designers or when you're working on your brand, you're not working on your logo. Your logo is part of your brand, but it's not your brand. And we'll see that in the steps. So to borrow from Han Hundley, who borrowed from Z. Frank, the brand is the emotional aftertaste that comes after an experience with a product or a service or a company or a person or an entity. Okay? You, you meet someone, a product or, or a person, or you read about it, and you get feelings. And that thing is the intangible value. So the logo is a two-dimensional icon. The brand is a multi-dimensional experience. And I'm sure that if you look at any of this, you get it. You know, you see something, you go, oh, I hate them. You know, oh, I love that. OK, that thing, that's it. That's the brand. Now, if you've thought, oh, I hate them, they're not really doing a good job, but that's their problem. So how did we get here? Okay, because things got complicated over the years. So the first thing, the first concept of branding is related to ownership. And that was because people had things and they had to distinguish, you know, my cattle from your cattle, my sheep from your sheep. And so, you know, they, the, we have documentation um, from the Lascaux Caves, which is some of the oldest that we have, it's 50,000 years ago, that depict marked cattle. And um, experts believe that cattle was marked with uh, paint or tar or some, some things that, would not, that was not very permanent. And Egyptians did that, and since the non permacy was a bit of an issue, uh, they, they then, about two to 3,000 BC, they figured that uh, burning it onto the thing was a little more permanent, and they liked that better. Not, not the things that got burned, but the owners. <laughs> and in fact, uh, brand and brander comes from Old Norse, and it means to burn. So <clears throat> a little later on, about two, 3,000 BC, um, branding started taking on a different meaning. Uh, that was a um, ownership um, meaning, meaning I made that. Um, and this was widespread. So makers of goods would put stamps or brand in some way their products to say, I made that. And also, sometimes, um, what the product was for or what material it was made with. Um, and archaeologists have identified about a 1,000 different unique potter's marks that were in use during the first three centuries of the Roman Empire. So there were about like you know 300 brands of pottery. And you can imagine, like, Old Romans going, oh, you know, I just got this vase from, you know, Marius Potterus, you know, and he's like really like the hottest guy at the moment. Um, so, Middle Ages um, guilds began using marks to their to distinguish their products. So, paper related guilds, meaning printer or paper makers, use watermarks. And stonemasons used um, marks to identify their products, the caves that were coming from, and the quarries, I'm sorry, that were coming from. And th there's actually, um, they made this like really elaborate system that histori historians documented, not me. I just found it out when I was doing research. Renaissance, um, artists always kind of marked their work, but usually with symbols. In the Renaissance, um, 
artists started saying, I don't want to put a mark on it. I want to put my name on it so people can come and know that I did that. And so this is Michelangelo's. Th that's the, what you're seeing, it's a detail of this like ribbon that's going across Mary's chest. And it says, you know, Michelangelo's Buonarrotis. So this was also kind of like the first uh, concept of authorship. You know? uh, I made that not only as, as an artisan, uh, but as, a, as an artist. The third issue, the, the third need solved by branding uh, since the Industrial Revolution is identification. Because when the Industrial Revolution happened, uh, everyone started producing goods. And say they made jars, glass jars, but they were all the same. So people needed, producers needed to identify their products from the rest of the people. So the first thing was, again, branding, was burning their names and their logos in uh, the crates that products were shipped in. And that led to packaging. So these are some of the first packaging, product packaging, which, by the way, in some cases look better than the current ones, but we're not going to get into that as well. Um, so we're fast forwarding uh, to a moment, a legal moment, that actually kind of, kind of was a, a very important in branding history, because the Trademarks Registration Act of 1875 uh, established legal rights to a trademark, and also established that a trademark, and thus a brand, was a property and could be sold it became a product in itself, or a company asset. So, okay, so we all are making our jars, and we are all, you know, distinguishing our jars from their jars, but then I need to convince people that my jars are actually really better, and they should buy my jars and not their jars, and that's when advertising comes up. And this um, gentleman, Mr. J. Walter Thompson, was one of the first uh, advertising men with a vision. And he was also the first creative age, the first advertising agency with a creative department that would design content for his clients. And he, uh, he also wrote two books that were guides for um, companies and producers uh, in which he kind of explained how good could advertising be for them. And you need to make an exercise because we live drenched in advertising, but imagine yourself being at a time where there was no advertising and someone was coming up to you and say, well, you know, you really should advertise your product. And people are like, eh, why? Because, you know, if you advertise, people are going to buy it. Ah, I don't know. You know, convince me. So he wrote these two books. He wasn't a great copywriter because they're called the Red and Blue Books of Advertising, which is not really catchy. <laughs> but so <clears throat> advertising. Obviously, advertising relies on media. If I don't have media to, di you know, to distribute my message, there is no advertising. And so advertising goes hand in hand with uh, technological development. So between the 20s and the 40s, advertising was on print and radio. And in the 40s, oh, someone invented television. And it was a game changer, a big game changer, not in the 40s and the 50s, but um, you know, we know about this guy. We, we all know about what, what was going on in the 60s with advertising because we've watched Mad Men, at least most of us. Um, but by the 50s and 60s, 
every household had a television. And the message went from USP, which is a unique selling proposition that's like, you really need toothpaste because you should really brush your teeth, to an emotional selling proposition that is like, well, you know, if you brush your teeth with my toothpaste, you'll have a whiter smile, better breath. Um, you know, you get laid more often. I don't know, you know, you have uh, emotional reasons, not... So you first establish that you gotta watch your, you know, brush your teeth. But once everyone's brushing your teeth, their teeth, then they, you know, you need, how... I need to convince you to buy my toothpaste because of emotional reasons because the practical reason is sold already. So in the 70s and 80s, televisions were everywhere. Every household had even more than one television, products, you know, just companies just had big budgets and spent big budgets and just bombarded people with spots and, and advertising. And in the 80s and 90s, brands, um, the concept of branding started shifting from the product to the producer. Uh, and that, if you think about it, it's pretty obvious, okay? Everyone knows my product, Nutella but they know the product. If I shift into convincing them that, yeah, the Walkman is great, but I am Sony and I am great, then the next product I'm going to go out, I'm gonna start with a leverage because that we have established that I am a producer of cool products rather than marketing each single product. So then comes the internet. And this really turned everything like not 360, not 720, what 720, 1080, something like that. So in uh, about a little over 20 years, um, all these guys, there is one guy in particular, oh, let me see. Oh, 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 what did I do? Oh, this, this is it. This guy, we know this guy, right? This one here. Um, this changed, totally, okay? So, because the communication changed. Actually, these two guys really changed things. Well, he changed things for all of us here. Uh, this guy changed things for our social relations. This guy changed for how we do business. We sell things. And this guy here really changed things because it took what was happening in our, on our desktops at home and put it in our pockets. And that's actually a huge change. Something that we also conveniently used to, but it's really, really recent. How many of you struggled when the, you arrived here? How many of you that are not Serbian, you know, and had no internet? Yeah, like, I'm not going out, because if I get lost, <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna be able to geolocalize myself, and you know, and I, and I can't really ask anybody, because I don't speak the language. So. And we're used to it. This is what? 10 years ago? Hmm? So, so this for branding had, has had two huge implications. The first one is that there's nowhere to hide, okay? We all know about reading in the news, I don't know, people being dragged out of airplanes in the United States 
with other people filming and going to Twitter saying, I don't think, you know, Mr. United Airlines, you really shouldn't be dragging people off the planes. Um, you know, like if you screw up, it's like, okay, five minutes later, you get a Twitter. Hey, big fail, brand whatever, you know. This is not working. This is not, this is not you, how you do things, okay? This was unconceivable t 10 years ago. I mean, you could write a letter. You could do like Meghan Markle and get really annoyed and write a letter like to, you know, the first lady and the president of Unilever and they would read it, but it wasn't like daily. The second thing is that we are all brands now and that's mostly due to social media, which means that we can all become influencers and very famous people and have lots of people coming at your workshops that you didn't expect to come. <laughs> uh, but we can also get hassled and bullied and attacked. That's not my case, so please don't do that. Um, you know, online, so we're all exposed, we're all naked, and we all need to be aware of this and manage this. The, you know, before like paparazzis were like a VIP person problem, like uh, I'm nobody, no one's gonna be lurking outside of my house taking pictures of me. Now we all potentially um, could be. But <coughs> on a less dramatic, from a less dramatic angle, the fact that we are all brands now means that we all have to A, be aware of it, B, manage it, C, use it. A lot of us are professionals, are you know, uh, freelancers, or do things, um, or entrepreneurs, that we all do things that needs this. And I guess that's why you're here, if I come to think about it. So, Branding, ownership, origin and quality, identification, differentiation, company asset, status symbol, reputation. Today, your brand is your kept promise to your customer. That's true if you are Nutella, that's true if you are Apple, that's true if you are Raffaele Isidori telling you, hey, come to my workshop, I'm gonna, you know, try and teach you something. If I don't do that, Wait, quick can we, uh, these yes, you will have the slides, yeah. <coughs> um, so, um, so, keeping your promise. Also because if you don't, Remember United Airlines, you should have that in your mind, you know, the, the guy being dragged and people filming and going, no, 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 okay? So, so they catch you, you know, you're lying. If someone goes to Twitter and say, you know, Rafael is there is lying, we went to her workshop and it's, and, and she talked about everything but what she had promised to talk about, that's gonna be really bad for me. So don't do it. <laughs> don't do it, I shouldn't give you ideas, but anyway. And I think Jeff Bezos put it really well. Your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room. So, cool. What do we do about this? You know, it's like, okay, establish that we need to do it. Now you're all very anxious. You know, last time I gave this talk, two people left going, oh my God, I have to go home and like look at my website. <laughs> because there's a whole bunch of things that are wrong. It's okay, it's okay. Um, rule number one, know yourself. And know yourself means know your product. If it's you, if you're a freelancer and you have to market yourself and you have to build your personal brand, then you have to know yourself. Not meaning who am I like after a trip, but what do I do? 
you know, what do I do? What do I offer? What is the value I provide? You know, why should people buy me? And that's true if you're a product, if you're a person. You know, why should people give me money for something? Know your customer. So once you know what you're selling or what you're offering or what value you're providing, you have to figure out who that value is valuable for. And you have to figure out where these interactions are happening. So I'm a freelance designer. Uh, I design websites for um, small businesses. OK, I got that down, right? And who's my client? Well, small businesses. But then this is true for a lot of web designer designing websites for small businesses. So what's my market? If I live in Belgrade, well, first, that's my, that's my primary uh, market, right? I'm going to try and sell my trade locally to the people that speak my language, have my culture that I can help better, rather than thinking, oh, I'm going to move to Barcelona and do it in Catalan and, you know, and be very lonely in a corner because no one knows you. The others are your, comp your competitors. And your competitors are not necessarily evil. And you're like, you don't have to know them so you can wait for them at night and eliminate them. You have to know them because there could be value in that. There could be value, first of all, because you have to know. If you're all saying, hey, I make very good websites uh, for Belgrade and Serbia. Uh, and I make them with a very good you know, price quality relate, you know, r ratio. There's a few of you that can say that. So if you know what your others are selling, and what your others are doing, maybe you can find a little different angle. Or maybe you can even find that, hey, how about we get together and do this? Because maybe I'm really, really good at one aspect. You know, maybe I'm a really good, I'm, I'm better at designing. And maybe you're better at developing. And instead of like fighting each other, maybe we can kind of like get a synergy going. So the others are not always evil. Yeah, sometimes they are. So, you know, you have to kind of like know them and then decide. OK. This is actually life lesson, OK? If you, if you do mindfulness or, 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 you know, oriental studies, you get to a point where it's like, oh my god, that's so true. If you don't know where you're going, you ain't going to get there. I mean, you're not, you think you're going, but you're like sort of like wandering out, uh, you know, around life like, I don't, know, I, don't know, I don't know. So, focus is really fundamental to get there faster. Without focus, you get there, maybe, but certainly not as speedily as you could. Remember United Airlines, the, the person getting dragged, and blah, 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 and people tweeting there? OK. We are thankfully evolving into a society with a little more, little, but it's a start, attention to value. And, and I mean moral value, ethical values. And we got to have them. I mean, we can't just be like, you know, the biggest bas bastard in town because there's Twitter. Someone's going to go and say, you know, hey. And also because we shouldn't. You know, we should be human beings before everything else. Obvious, but you have to have a plan. Just like you have to have a vision, just like, you know, you have to have, like, focus. Like, what do I want to achieve? 
You gotta have a plan. Um, metaphor. You decide, I've always wanted to do that, never got around to do it because of life. Um, I've always wanted to like get in the car with just some clothes and money and my phone and internet connection <laughs> and drive. You know, just drive. I, I don't know where I'm going. I'm, I'll be back in a week. I'm just going to start driving and then, I don't know, you know. And that's like, it's, it's on my bucket list of the things that I want to do. And it's like a week, certainly, full of experiences and fun, but with no plans of getting anywhere. If I want to go to Belgrade, I need to make a plan, OK? I need to figure out, how can I go to Belgrade? I need an airplane, because from Milan, walking is not. And at first, I actually said, well, I'm going to drive to Belgrade. Sounds cool. I'm going to do one of those, you know, almost, you know, cool trips on my bucket list. And then I was like, let's have a strategy here. I'm going to take my car and drive for like 12 hours in a country I don't know. And I didn't even consider that I would not have uh, internet. So, you know, in retrospective, uh, you know. And, and after evaluating my strategy, I said, it's a really bad idea. I'm going to take a plane. It's cheaper, faster, and gets me there. So, so your brand is not, is not going to come out of, I mean, it could come, like my, the trip on my bucket list. But if you have a plan, it works better, really. It's hard. This is one of the hardest things. You'll see it, because that's what you're going to do after the break. Um, your brand is a virtual persona. It has to have a personality, and it has to be appropriate. I mean, you could be a tattooed all over, like, bank lawyer. You, you could be. You can be. There are. I mean, I've done research. Um, <laughs> but it's, you're not going to be what people expect. And if you show up with like the biggest bank in your nation, and you, you know you have a client because you might be getting them as a client, and you arrive looking like a hell's angels, you're not gonna get the client. You're not. Gonna, they're gonna look and they say, "Excuse me, who are you? We're waiting for you know, Mr. So and So," um, because you have to work with people's expectations and bias. So how do you convey your brand's personality? First thing is graphic design. This is when we think logo. Until now, we just know that we need a logo. But we need to do all that stuff before so that when we get here, we have all the elements that we need to make a logo red or blue, square or round, or with little flowers, or like, you know, awesome, or looking like the ACDC, you know, logo, whatever. But we have gotten there by going through steps one through eight, I think, or one through seven, I forgot. Now, once I have my logo and my colors, the key is consistency. If I have a different logo every year, people are going to think I'm someone new every year, every year. And it's good if I want them to think I'm someone new every year. But if I want to build credibility, people have to be able to recognize me. So consistency is one of the key things to build your brand. The second thing is, and that's why I need to know my target, is the tone of voice and the type of language. If I am building um, skateboards for skateboarding teenagers, I'm going to have a look, a tone of voice. I'm going to speak to them in a way that it's very different 
that if I'm branding earring aids for senior citizens, okay? So, and that's why I need to know who I am and who I'm talking to, because that is going to have a huge impact on how, what I say and how I say it. And again, coherence. You know, if like one day I'm all friendly, the next day I'm like super serious, you know, people are gonna think either that I am a psychopath or that I'm two different people, two different companies. It's, they may not realize it, but they get a cognitive dissonance. Things don't make sense at an instinctive level. When people at an instinctive level get a bad feeling, they will go away. You lose points. Because people are like, oh, I don't know. But when I don't know, I'll just move over. The third thing is how I talk to my clients, how I relate. Um, if I'm a freelancer, and every time my client has a problem, I'm too busy or on vacation, or, yeah, I'll call you in five minutes, and I call them three days later, they ain't going to like it. You know, you're going to lose that client. Um, if, if, how many of you, that's a stupid question, how many of you, you have a WordPress website on and have plugins uh, on them and use them? All of you, right? Mm -hmm. So, how are your feelings toward a plugin or a theme when you have an issue and you contact support and you get, uh, yeah, go to the forum and ask your question there. Someone maybe is going to answer you, or you get someone saying, hey, I'm going to look into this and get back to you with an answer, and they actually do. I mean, you love the second ones, and you kind of like, you kind of hate the first ones, and if you can, you dump them, and if you can't because they're, only, they're the only one providing the service, you kind of stay there like, wait until I can dump you, okay? So service, you know, how you treat people, uh, it matters. Then, okay, so you've done all your work, you've done all your strategy, it's all clear, you've made this, you know, you ask your friend designer to help you make this really cool uh, logo and really cool, you know, um, visual interface. And then you have to communicate because no one knows you exist, I mean, except your friends and family. So you gotta let them know. Now, here, why is the key competence? Because communicating is not as easy as it sounds. So you either get competent by studying, you know, by, by getting informed and reading and coming to workshops where you learn all this stuff, uh, or you get someone to help you, and maybe you pay them something. How do you communicate in the 21st century? There's three types of communication. Um, and they generally get this, you know, uh, divided in paid, owned, and earned. Paid media is what you pay for. That's advertising, any form, traditional, digital, Owned media is the media you own. That's your website, that's your Facebook page, your um, Twitter accounts, um, but also the email you sent your customers. So everything that you control. And the third is earned media. And that's what you get from other people. And what you get from other people is good stuff if you've done good stuff and like, ugh, fail Twitter tweets <laughs> if you do bad. We'll get back to that. Uh, I know, this is obvious. It's like, oh, but I don't have money. I know, you don't, I don't have money. None of us do. You know, and if we do, you, we do other things with money, like buy stupid things we don't need. 
But this is not spending. This is investing. This is something that is you. So you want to do everything that is necessary to have the best possible result with what you have. You, this, is, this is a design principle, actually. You, know, you work hard, you stay at it, you check often, um, you stay consistent. If something is not working, you look at it, you change it, you, you know, fine tune it. Um, being mindful doesn't mean being a nice person, means being aware of what's going on. Co you know, something bad happens and you come up with a, like this literally stupid, inopportune tweet. No. Okay, so you, you, all of us live in a context, and we cannot remove ourselves with the, from that context. We need to be aware of what's going on around us. That's also, also where we get a lot of information and value from, by listening, by being mindful. Now, if your brand is a personal brand, steps one through seven are the same. Uh, rules 9, 10, and 11 are the same. Uh, you are your personal brand. So if you are the tattooed all over lawyer, don't hide it. I mean, hide it as much as you need to. You know, like wear a suit when you're going to, you know, don't get tattooed on your face. I mean, you know, you know that's, that's hard, you know. But you can go to your big meeting with the bank client you want to take home, kind of like covering up and l trying to look not as menacing, OK? But be yourself, OK? We know these guys, right? Everyone knows who these guys are? Yes, no? Elon Musk and Gary Vaynerchuk. They have their style. You know, that's it, that's, that's me. You don't like me, don't follow me. Don't come listen to me, don't buy my Tesla. Ha, don't come work for me. Um, you know, it's, it's okay. It's okay to be who we are, any, any one of us. You know, there's value in any of us. We don't need to conform. In fact, our value as personal brands is the fact that we are we. We don't have to be liked by everybody. We have to be liked by the people that will be in tune with us. We, you know, and, and that's the people that are gonna work with us. So who cares if someone that has nothing to do with me and that I would never wanna work with doesn't like me? I don't like you either. So, you know, you have to curb yourself, you know, because you, it, it's, it's public, but it's you. You are a value. So, value yourself. So, see, you, you just cover up. So, quickly, I'm doing okay. Um, first tip tools, communication. So offline paid media, okay? Remember we talked about paid media. That's the stuff that you dish out money for. Um, the, the way you can get paid media offline is advertising, like on television, but I don't think none of us have the budget. Um, but maybe on trade magazines, maybe on local magazines, if, say, we, our activity is a brick and mortar activity, I can, you know, maybe take out a page on like a tourist guide magazine for tourists so they can come to my artisan shop in Belgrade. I can sponsor, and that you see a lot here. Okay, that's, that's a very good way to make your brand, uh, raise your brand awareness. And, you know, like, how many pizza places and flyers do you, do you have at home? You know, that's, that's print direct marketing. The stuff you get in your mailbox. 
online paid media. Display or banner advertising, search advertising, that's AdWords to, for example, social media advertising, that's paid, you know, paid tweets or sponsored tweets or paid Facebook advertising. Um, digital direct marketing, email uh, marketing, and influencers marketing. Because some of the people that got really famous online, they can actually get paid to tweet about your product. Um, offline own media. If you have a brick and mortar activity, your store and your windows display and what you do, you know, the sign that you put on your store, the, the, the information you share with in your store, your visual merchandising, the brochures, the flyers, the, the printed institutional material you give your client where you live with your client, the folder, the offers, the, the, the slides that you go and you know, do your pitch with, and promotional material, swag. Your online owned media is your website, your blog if you have one, and your official social media pages and or accounts. Let's discuss this. You gotta have a website. In, in 2018, you have to have a website. People are gonna look, are, they're gonna look for you online. I mean, unless you sell like bread and you only wanna sell it to your neighbors. But still. You gotta have it as nice, curated, and coherent with your you as a brand as possible, okay? If I'm a designer or a web agency and I tell you how cool and detailed oriented and professional I am and you get on my website and my website looks like from 1999, got typos in it and had like the, the like, crappiest, you know, usability, you're gonna come, you're not gonna hire me to make your website. And if you are, it's probably because I'm asking you 100 euros for it, but it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's a bad movie, okay? Um, very often today, it used to be the business cards, the first thing that people saw of you. Today, most likely, the first thing they see about you is your website and either they're gonna say, wow, or they say, what? You don't want them to say, what? That's not good. Uh, digital present. Does your brand need an app? If so, make sure that it works. Make sure that it's nice. Make sure that it's something that people will wanna download and keep on their phone. If not, don't. We're not at a stage where I gotta have an app by all means. You have a blog, you produce content, make sure you provide value. How many of you read every day? How many of you read things that don't give a damn? I'm sorry, I have to like uh, curb myself because I don't generally talk like this. I talk like, I talk like a, a, a truck driver, and it, so I have to think. Um, uh, so, how many of you read things that you like? You read the first two one, you're like, I don't, know, I don't gear crap about this. None. No, you do. I no, you, read the first two lines. Yeah, you first line, and then you're like, I got better things to do. I mean, unless it's something your client is sending you, and you have to read it or it's your homework and you have to read it, or it's the homework you gave your students to do and you have to read it, and you're like, why do I give them homework? <sighs> They're so bad. I do this every year, I like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get like to the, a no homework stage because it's painful reading them. Uh, CEO, uh, oh, you gotta know what CEO is. CEO is your friend. Use it. None of us is going to show up first on Google ever unless they Google our name. 
in which case, if we don't come up first, we have a big problem. But in all the other cases, we don't want them to, we don't want to come up first in Google for whatever, but if I make very cool websites in Belgrade with, you know, that are very well done and reasonably priced, and someone says, you know, web agency in Belgrade, it'd be nice if I show up, you know, on first page or second, maybe. Otherwise, I ain't gonna get any clients. SEO works, SEO helps. Um, and you gotta be coherent, again, you know. I make really cool web design. I come to your web design and it's horrible and like sloppy with typos in it. Yeah, goodbye. Social media presence. That's another uh, very important tool for building your brand. Um, you should be on social media, meaning you should have a presence on social media. You think Facebook is a place where people just waste their time, then don't go to Facebook and waste your time, but be on Facebook, okay? So having an account on Facebook and staying two hours watching what your friends are doing, they're two different concepts, okay? You can have a profile because you need a profile to make a page that you communicate. If you want to take your phone on the, in the you know, toilet with you and see what they're doing, that's a different story and that's your choice. Want to waste hours doing that? You want to get into flames discussing like the least important things in the world with people you don't know? You can do that, but it's your fault, not social media, okay? They're two different things. Um, how many of you are not on LinkedIn? Okay, you should be. You should be because when someone is looking for you to hire you, they're going to come and look for you on LinkedIn. You're not on LinkedIn, you kind of don't exist. <laughs> you, know, you do exist, but you kind of don't exist. And y you should be there. Um, and you should be there well. So you should be here, you should be there not with a picture from like last night's party where you're like totally, uh, you know, let's do selfies drunk, okay? You don't put that as your profile picture. Um, you don't like really expose your, your like ultras, soccer, you know, passions on LinkedIn, you know, or your very racist, bigot thoughts. Okay, you don't want to do that because you're. This is professional. Okay, so you want people that may want to hire you to come there and have all the important information, the work you do, the school you've done, your projects. Okay, more and more people are going to go there before they even look at your CV. So use it. It's free. <coughs> So Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest. You here, we're diff you know, these are social networks that you may or may not want to be on. It depends who's your audience, you know, who you're trying to reach. So these three, you should be there. At least have an account. These others, it depends. Are you making, um, is your target like young millennials? Then get yourself, you know, a, an Instagram account and put like pictures of things that are going to be interesting for your audience, even if you despise it. Um, and then there are trades and ecosystem things for example, WordPress. So if you are in the WordPress community, you should have a WordPress.org account, and you might seriously consider 
being on the international Slack and your local Slack, or all the Slack channels that you could be interested in, because that's where people like you are interacting. Earned media, offline, mentions in trade press. It's pretty obvious, right? Ratings, reviews, you know, um, if you're in the uh, travel hotel industry, you know, your reviews on trip advisors, they, they matter. People read them and they're like, yeah, no one wants to go there, uh, let's not go there and word of mouth referrals. So you want to try to have this and have it good. And if you're managing the communication for a restaurant or a hotel and people give bad reviews, two things you don't do with bad reviews. First thing you don't get online and say, you are an idiot. Even if they were, you know, you don't. Because the people are going to read the review and give it so-so weight. And then they're going to read the way you answer to that review. And they're going to judge you on that. Okay? So if you go, back, if you go online, it's like, you're an idiot. You and your friends, you should all die really bad. <laughs> no, no point. <laughs> right? Um, so those are to be managed. You find a nice way to deal with it. It's customer service. Word of mouth referrals. Online, online you get mentioned in trade blogs. Um, you get referred, you know, word of mouth, online word of mouth. You know, I think it might have happened to all of you. Like, oh, I'm going to London next week. Can you suggest a really good restaurant that I can go to? Okay, that's online referral. Mentions in social media. Get in the practice. This is actually, it's really nice. If you get into this sort of loop where you support your, you know, your, your followers and, and you interact with them, uh, and again, you have your ratings and reviews, and that's the point I just made. Okay, online media needs to be monitored because it can go sour really fast. Actions. Physical presence. So you're all here, so you kind of know that already. But go to trade shows and conferences that are related to your business. Go to local meetups or events or where people, you know, get together. Um, go, if, you, if you're a small web agency, uh, go to the... Um, a co commercial association, you know, like there's every city has like, you know, an association of uh, merchants or shops or whatever. Go to them. Say, ah, do you guys need a website? You know, um, volunteering or mentoring or offering workshops on what you know how to do for free to people so that they understand better what you do, these are all ways to get yourself known and build your brand. Um, you can interact online and you can be a mentor or ask to be mentored online. And you can produce content, but please make it good. Remember that question, how many of you read the first two lines and, you know, like if you got to read, if you got to write something crappy, don't. No one's going to read it, really. Like, not even your mom. It's just go, oh, do I? oh, yeah, I read it. It's beautiful. Um, if you know how to do something, write tutorials. Maybe if you, if you speak a language that it's not very well spoken, you know, that it's not very popular, write them in your language. There's plenty of tutorials written in English, but maybe there aren't that many written in Serbian. And, and Serbians are going to be really happy if they can follow a tutorial that they can understand 100% and not 70%. Um, shareable, valuable content, okay? Memes, we shared that, right? Cat things, 
um, it's that's not very valuable. That's just fun. But if it's shareable and valuable, it gets shared a lot more. This is easy. It's do all the things that I just told you to do. <laughs> basically, you know, have a strategy, work at it, stay consistent, be present, be aware, um, monitor what's going on, and dare. Dare. You know, speak up. Uh, ask to speak at me. Uh, you know, at meetups. Um, don't be afraid to expose yourself. Uh, you know, sometimes we're like, yeah, but I don't want to seem arrogant. You want to be arrogant. Arrogant in, in, in a nice, not in an arrogant way, but you know, uh, you can't build your brand by being shy in a corner. It's, it's a contradiction, you know? You, you can't build a brand and be transparent. No one's going to see you. So, this is what a brand is. A brand is an organic, living, breathing being. It's a baby, okay? You, you make this baby, and then you gotta care for this baby. Do you remember the Tamagotchi thing? Okay, they die. They die if you, uh, I, 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 also your cats and dogs and children die if you don't feed them and care for them, but that's kind of like, they come to you and say, you know, um, I used to have fish. I had just one, like a fish tank, and then it, they would die all the time because I would forget. They, they, it's horrible, but hey, you know, it's me. Remember, be be true. Um, so I only have cats and dogs because if I forget about them, they kind of come like uh, food, <laughs> you know, like hello, you know, or like uh, you know, they'll poo outside their litter and it's like clean it. So, you, you gotta love it. It's, it's you know, you, you have to think of it that it's not an optional, it's, it's you. It's you in the year 2020, okay? It's, you can't hide anymore. And we all do, okay? We will all occasionally step on a pool, send out the wrong Twitter, Hell, send out the wrong <laughs> WhatsApp message. Uh, like a couple of months ago, and I sw it, it's a friend, but I swear to you, it's not my story, because I've learned that lesson before. So this friend, client of mine, writes me, and calls me at like 11 o'clock at night, and she said, oh my God, I just sent a WhatsApp message that I meant to send to you, and it wasn't a nice WhatsApp message to the person I was bad-mouthing, and it had their name in it. And so I was like, well, lesson number one, you don't do that. <laughs> you don't do that. Remember values, you know, just be nice. But, you know, and then she was like, I don't know how I did that. Okay, so you, you, the attention has to be kept up. And when you step in a pool, Okay, so I did something stupid. It happens. She didn't do this. She couldn't. She just lied. She's like, I don't know. I just got that, and I thought I should share it with you. Because it was, it was not, like, she could not have said, I didn't really mean the horrible things I wrote about you in that message. So she had to come up with an excuse. But in general, you know, you screw up. We all screw up. And if someone judges, they're not going to judge you because you screwed up, it's like, the, it's like how you answer to reviews. People are not going to judge you on the fact that you made a mistake. They're going to judge you on how you deal with your mess up. And learn it. Yeah, that, don't do it again. You know, that's, yeah. So we'll take a break, and then we'll put it in practice. Thank you. I am in the area.